Uh, all right. Well, I guess we can do this podcast this week. Since we skipped on it last week. Not that anybody knew that until I said something. Right. And that'll be edited out anyway, so not a problem. Good. I, I feel like you're going to leave it in just to fuck with me. I might. <laughs> you might do that. Uh, hey, we're running behind anyways. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of I Don't Give a Flick. I am one of your hosts, Johnny Blackburn. And I'm Gary Elmore. With Neil Riley. Woo-woo! And LCRA Dan. Dan, how's it going? Wait a minute, why am I in the chopper? (laughs) (laughs) Inside joke, no one's going to get except the three of us. Uh, Everybody, welcome back to another episode. Uh, This week we're going to be discussing uh, Hollywood blockbusters and some of the highest grossing movies of all time and what makes a Hollywood blockbuster. Uh, I'm excited for this one just due to the fact that we are currently in the summer months. And uh, actually, and this, Neil had suggested uh, this topic uh, the other week when we were coming up with our ideas for the next couple months. Uh, and most of our other most of our other topics haven't really been about the season that we're currently in. So this will be probably the most relevant one outside of our first one that was based on pandemic films. Uh, so excited to see that. Uh, let's let's just jump into it and stuff. Uh, uh, Gary, I know that you, we had kind of been chatting about this earlier about uh, to you what makes a solid blockbuster. Right. What, what creates droves and droves of people to go and see these films? What do you think? Well, I think a lot of the blockbusters really get a lot of their momentum from you know, marketing, advertising, and then just sort of the buzz once they're out. Because you'll typically see with a a major blockbuster that unlike a normal movie that really spikes in the first week and then has, you know, significant drop off for ticket sales of like 60% every week thereafter, blockbusters tend to maintain a really high level of ticket sales for several weeks running before they start to come down. I mean, and sometimes they even have re-releases if they're so popular in the theaters. So, uh, you know, a blockbuster really has to have a lot of buzz and build behind it in order sure. to, to really be successful and get up into the stratosphere when you're talking about uh, how much money they make. I mean, I think that's that's accurate, too, especially when you look at movies that are tagged as being a blockbuster and they come out the opening weekend. And even though the critic reviews aren't super great on them, they've done a really good job with the marketing and the branding mm-hmm. ahead of time. So those droves of people come out to see them. Then seeing that movie, realize the critics were right and right. it did suck. And so they might have a, a gigantic opening weekend uh you know, amount of revenue coming in. And then after that, the next three months are, it's just dwindling. A a good example of that would be movies such as like, um, uh, you know, uh, Jurassic uh, World. Yeah, uh, Jurassic World, which it, is one it made I a whole read. lot of money because people were really excited to see a new Jurassic Park film right. uh, come out. But a lot like sort of the Star Wars prequels, uh, it was maybe not as good as people were hoping that it would be. Okay, Neil, what about you? What do you think makes a what do you think makes a, a good solid blockbuster? Uh, I think one of the biggest aspects for for highest grossing blockbusters, not the ones adjusted for inflation, but of all mm-hmm. times are the ones that are sequels to already great movie franchises. So, yeah. you know, you got, you know, your Star Wars, the, the sequels, you got your uh, Avengers series, any of those, they're building on the already successful parts of the previous films. Right. And I think we it was funny because when we have we have two lists that we based this week's episode off of and the one that you're that Neil's referring to, it had five Marvel movies mm-hmm. in the top ten. And this is for the list not adjusting for inflation, um, but five. Yeah, five from from one, not like five from Paramount or Miramax or Disney or something. I guess it's from Disney, but five from one production company. Yeah, and if you actually look at <laughs> Disney, I think they've got eight. Yeah, because they had the, the Star Wars on there. The they Star had Wars. Avatar. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, there was another one. We'll, we'll get to that. We'll though. get to that in a second. Um, and yeah, I, I'd have to agree. I mean, I, I think personally for me, what what makes a blockbuster outside of the marketing being so pivotal to, pivotal to its success is it's always it's always uh, it's not necessarily even the A list actors that you may have. Honestly, mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of these movies that have been built up to blockbusters over the last. 10 to 20 years, even before that, are really based around the popularity of a book series, the popularity of comic books as we mm-hmm. look at Marvel, the popularity of um, maybe an old children's tale. You know, you can look at something like The Lion King, you look at something like Frozen, um, something like that. So I think some type of movie that has an already pre-existing crowd ahead of time is is 
probably the most pivotal thing next to marketing when it comes to actually making those movies successful. Yeah, like a loyal fan base to kind of carry it through. I mean, you'll yeah. see a lot of uh, remakes that are done with uh, movies that are like... Uh, not very good like the new uh, Star Trek movies but they've got such a loyal fan base with the new Star Wars you know that it carries them through to you know past that you know billion dollar threshold you're never going to let that go are you no the, the Star Trek they're all terrible is, horrible is, movies is there okay let's 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 I, I'm, I've always played devil's advocate with that I, I like them better than you do for sure Neil what do you think of the the most recent J.J. Abrams Star Wars trilogy uh, Star Trek trilogy I mean, I'm not a big fan of them. I mm -hmm. like the classics. Uh, so the remakes to me were just a little too over the top. I okay. was not a fan. I mean, I, I get it. I think it was Jacob. We had a, our friend Jacob Johnson from Reese and Jacob versus Evil on a couple weeks ago. And he had he and Gary were talking about during our evolution of sci fi episode um, where they were chatting about. Uh, how he enjoyed the new Star Trek because they took a completely, they took the same world and, and kept it. some of the yeah. same elements, but then they turned it around and created a different series with the same characters, right. which yeah. is why he enjoyed it. Right, so, but it was just terrible garbage. All of the all of the new Star Treks, all of the I new hear Star Wars. For it. I get it. I'm not saying way with certain with certain types of movie franchises. So, is there anything just for fun? Just for is fun. there anything if they made a four Star Trek or went back and remade those Star Treks? Mm -hmm. Is there anything that Abrams could do for the two of you for your enjoyment level uh -huh. that they could do to fix your the current? you know, distaste that you have for those films. Yeah. I mean, if they made a, you know, a Star Trek or Star Wars movie, um, you know, that was actually, you know, about Star Trek or Star Wars, I think, uh, <laughs> that would be, uh, much better. I, I think these Star Wars, uh, uh, sequels were m closer to the original Star Wars than uh -huh. the Star Trek, uh, Remakes were to what Star Trek actually is. Okay. And um, it, I think if you get back to what the actual story is um, and like the, the, the reason for the story being there, it would be, in my opinion, better. Now, if you want to release, you know, those Star Trek movies and just call it like Space Adventure or whatever and not have it actually do anything with Star Trek, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that would be fine. But it's not really a Star Trek movie. I mean, it's a completely different um, fundamental principle. Okay. Neil, how about you? I mean, I, I don't think you can go back and change what's already been done. Uh, I mean, if we went back and recast every single character and rewrote all the stories, yeah, maybe we could make a decent project. <laughs> if it was a completely different movie, then sure, yeah, I'd love it. would be great. I, mean, I, understand, I understand why they did it. It's mass appeal, and it's in order to create new stories other than just retelling stories that have already been told. I mean, I get it, but at the same time, I don't have to like it. Yeah, no, it's it's all crap, and you know, it's fine not to like garbage. But no, you know, so that's good. It's okay to be wrong. Don't worry about now, it. Now, I still like you guys. Batman versus Superman. No, uh, no, no, no. We're not going into the friggin' DC universe. No, no. it's 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 not happening. Zach, the DC Zach, universe is crap. Just it, it, it is. It, it, Zack Snyder, uh, he did enough to to bash that into oblivion and I, I will say the wonder woman movie was you know well, sure. pre, you know pretty one. good i i didn't <laughs> much care for the ending of it but right. I, I thought that uh it it did a good job of having her character you know what kind of actually bothered me about that one is they they made the movie at, when they i forgot the name of the screenwriter but he had actually stated you know we we wrote the film obviously to have one of the first female superheroes mm -hmm. and stuff and you pay homage to her but we wanted to write it to not show the typical female character where it's the damsel in distress or where she falls in love with the guy and then goes back to him at the end. But that's exactly what Wonder Woman did. Mm -hmm. Like, she fell in love with Chris Pine's character and then she fell in love. Well, it's in the Star Trek series. Right. And, and <laughs> okay, all right, all right, everybody, calm down. And he, he falls in love. She falls in love with him, almost gets killed because of that relationship and then ends up still saving him in the end. Well, she doesn't save him, I guess, technically, until this most recent one that's coming out. Spoiler um, alert. <laughs> if you haven't seen a movie that's four years if old, you haven't seen point, a movie that hasn't four... come out yet, then no, no, I, if I you don't haven't know seen what to tell Oh, you. the, the previews, <laughs> the previews show that he's alive in that. Come on. Um, anyways, I digress. I digress. Uh, okay, so let's jump in really quick to uh, the list of the most profitable uh, let's let's go ahead and let's let's start with this list because this one really interested yeah. me the most. And I, I think this list is more accurate than sure. So we've got two lists for what blockbuster movies are, and for our criteria for that, it's just basically which movies made the most money. Um, and so uh, we there's two lists. There's one that's adjusted for inflation, and then there's one that is not. 
Um, I think the list that is adjusted for inflation is uh, a more accurate list because right. uh, it's not really fair. You're not really comparing apples to apples if you don't try and control for that. Right. Uh, you know, price and uh, tickets from 1938 is going to be much different than in 2000. Well, we don't have any in 2020, but in 2019, the <laughs> we last did at year the of beginning society, of the year. Yeah. yeah. Um, so let, let's take a look. Let's go. Let's go with top ten. Let's go from the bottom and work our way up. Uh, Gary, what was number ten okay. on the list of most successful gross profits uh, adjusted for inflation of all time? Okay. okay. Yeah. For box office sales, yeah. um, we uh, at number ten comes in at Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, the 1937 Disney movie. Uh, it had a estimated admission of 109 million tickets uh, with a gross value of 982 million dollars. Yeah, adjust, adjusted for now. Okay. Yeah. Does that? I understand this was this was Disney's first feature length animated film. I get that, and I understand that it, the Mickey Mouse character was really popular in the short movies that had come out from Walt Disney in the 30s. Mm-hmm. But is anybody else a little surprised by this one? Well, I think one of the main contributing factors for this one is the fact that I don't think it made much money on its initial release, but it's been released at least three times since 1937. That's right. So the combined overall money it's brought in brings it up to that level. Okay. Yeah, it has had a longer time to try and uh, accumulate uh, ticket sales. Yeah, I mean, mean, you know, approximately 80 years almost at this point, you know, 83 years. Um, Yeah, for sure. No, I mean, that's a good point. Out of all the Disney movies that I've ever seen, I, you know, I wouldn't put Snow White my probably even in my top 20 honestly it's not that i don't like it it's just yeah i think it's one of the it's an old ones. story it's i mean yeah it doesn't true. appeal i think it doesn't yeah. carry as well as it did today as it did in 1937 sure. right and no you're right it's, it's funny i sound like a hypocrite because that was my exact argument earlier why mm-hmm. well, we're successful just a little off. johnny just a little yeah <laughs> i'm a hypocrite don't listen but, to me at all it's but, fine. uh yeah i mean and i i think that it's um when sort of those original Disney movies are very interesting because the artwork style that they had, you know, you, you don't have that anymore with CGI, right. but you know, you had a lot of sort of hand drawn artwork. That's, you know, it just looks like it took a lot of craft and right. skill to make. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's, let's keep on. Let's, let's keep moving on. we got a lot of lists to go through today. What's a uh, number nine. A number nine would be The Exorcist from 1973. Ah, okay. It had an estimated ticket sales of 116.5 million for a box office total of 1.04 billion dollars. God, can you imagine if somebody had broken that record in the 70s without the inflation? Just like in the 70s, they had been like, "Oh, tickets were 12 dollars a pop, and it broke a billion dollars." Like how monumental that would be, fucking 50 years ago at this point. Yeah, that, um, that would have been a lot of money. I mean. You know, I I'm not really I'm not really super surprised by this one. I mean, this was one of the only horror films to ever be nominated for an Oscar for best picture, uh, nominated for best soundtrack, best visual effects, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, so this one this one doesn't really shock me most. I mean, this is when we think of the classic horror film like the granddaddy of them all. We think of the Exorcist being up there with Psycho and mm-hmm. uh, uh, Secret Window or Rear Window, yeah, uh, and you know the birds stuff like that. Um, Bird Demic, yeah, yeah. Bird, no, Gary, not Bird Demic. Bird, Bird Demic, no, no. <laughs> where they're shooting the birds down yeah. with like fake guns, essentially, <laughs> just firing pellets at them. Oh, let's shoot these yeah. demon birds down with but the, the, the Exorcist is a really interesting movie because I think if you released it today, it would not do very well. Probably not. Um, just because it's it's paced very differently um, than, you know, a modern movie is. It's much more, you know, thought provoking and you don't have a lot of the action scenes that people tend to like nowadays. Well, you look at yeah. a lot of. Go ahead. I mean, yeah, as far yeah. as horror, as far as horror movies goes, you're right. It's kind of a slower paced one. It's not the quick cut jump scares that is kind of what's happening nowadays. It is. It is a, a more thought provoking film. Yeah. Currently, yeah. Currently, I have to. I totally agree. Currently, society for all of our horror films in the last thirty years, if you think about it, the majority of them are based on blood and gore. And and yeah, no, the, the jump scares. Uh, what do we got for eight? Uh, number eight is Doctor Zhivago, which is 1965's <laughs> release. It had 124.6 million ticket sales, uh, with a gross box office adjusted for inflation of 1.12 billion dollars. Jeez. So yeah, and it. Uh, a lot of these older movies, they do get um, 
because of inflation over the the last you know seventy eighty. But you also years. have to remember there weren't as many movies coming out during the sixties right. and seventies. Like the selection for people to go watch them was mm. significantly smaller. Right, but there were mm. also a lot fewer people. I mean, in nineteen sixty five, mm. in the sixties, I think the population of the United States was somewhere around two hundred million, mm-hmm. and uh, so you know you've got. 50% fewer people. Right. And what's that's that's what's interesting to me, because if you had listened to our podcast on the 1960s, you would have noticed that one of the stats we threw out to you is that on average, half of every American household across the country, obviously, uh, had a television set mm-hmm. of some kind, which was the most in history at that time. So box office numbers were going down across the board, regardless of what movie was coming out. So it surprises me that Dr. Shivago, made in 65, had done so well. Um, I've actually... I actually have not seen this. This is one of Nor the few. Nor have I. Yeah. Huh? Nor have I. Um, really? Yeah. Okay. Neil, have you have you seen Doctor Shivago? Maybe we should watch that. And Interesting. Do cool. I'm a little embarrassed. I would have sworn that between the three of us, one it, of us would have seen it. It did win five Academy Awards. Ah, so. we are horrible at our jobs. Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> this is awful. I don't even want to, like, guess why this did really well at the box office outside of having some big names in it. Uh, let's move on to seven. <laughs> okay. Uh, number seven, of course, is the original blockbuster, uh, Jaws, 1975. Um, it had 128 million ticket sales for adjusted in, uh, box office of $1.15 billion. Damn. So Jaws is really what you think of when you think of the first summer blockbuster. You know, it came out in... Oh, you for know, sure. Yeah, and like it had a major impact on the the culture because you know don't be you know just when you thought it was safe to go into the water, which <laughs> I think was the tagline for the second one, but it really kind of had that um, you know everyone kind of talked about it you know yeah. and yeah. It, it was it was a, a really well done movie, mm-hmm. um, and if you you know read about or hear about any of the like making of the movie like they had all these problems with bruce which is the shark the the animatronic shark uh so they couldn't really show it for most of the movie because there were so many problems with it but don't you think don't you think that adds to the suspense the suspense and the the tension with building of that final conflict between the shark and i mean i know it may have hindered them initially but in the end i think it strengthened the movie as a whole because they didn't uh, show the shark as much they talked about it yeah i think that was uh, the best thing that could have happened because it forced them to focus on the characters a lot more uh, than just having the random shark going around attacking people which uh would not have been as nearly as good of a movie i think um so i I think it's scary for sure absolutely not yeah Yeah. and i think that that uh was probably one of the most fortunate things that could have happened uh, to any director, because as we all know, that was directed by you know the best director of all time. The best director of all time. Uh, no, well, from and obviously, yeah. obviously, no. one of the key components no. is having the best actor of all time. You know, Richard Dreyfus. But right. you know. yeah, yeah, Richard Dreyfus. <laughs> oh yeah, good old, good old eight-time nubby and Nickelodeon Kids Teen Choice Award winner Richard Dreyfus. Just kidding. He never won. What about those. Bob? What about Bob? It was a fantastic yeah. movie. Yeah. And anything Bill Murray comedy is going to be gold. It's, you know, Life Aquatic, Groundhog mm-hmm. Day. It, it doesn't matter. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, especially with Jaws, I think the reason it had been so popular, too, was also the fact that it was it, it was the first major realistic aquatic monster movie. Okay. Um, we had had Godzilla. We had had King Kong. Um, go back to our episode if you haven't seen it, the evolution of sci, uh, the evolution of sci-fi, where we had kind of talked about uh, the rise of the kaiju and uh, you know the the King Kong. Uh, It'll be episode so. six for those listening. Yeah, yeah. You can go ahead and check it out on our page. Um, and I think this is the first time that they had actually brought in a very realistic scenario, which we had talked about. Nowadays, we're, as a society and a society of moviegoers, we're used to that. We're used to these realistic situations being placed in front of us. So would Jaws have done as well? Same thing mm-hmm. in present day. Probably would have still done well, but I don't know if it would have done as well. It you was know, perfect timing, it seems yeah, like, for it, it. For me, I would say that Jaws is such a, a strong movie that it, w- it would still do well today as you said there's a lot more in some ways competition for movies today than there were back then because there's so many more released and absolutely disney owns everything so um 
I mean, if it was made by Disney, I guess it'd be fine. Although, I don't think Disney would put that movie out, necessarily. Poss- possibly not. Um, <laughs> what do we got for number six? Uh, number six is uh, The Ten Commandments, 1956, with Charlton oh, Heston. Oh, God. Uh, a four-hour epic. Uh, <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is a long movie. I'm having PTSD um, already. It had 131 million ticket sales. Oh. Uh, adjusted gross of $1.18 billion. I understand that Charlton Heston and Yule Brenner were the stars of this, but I remember my my mother would every Easter make us watch this. You would start at oh, would start absolutely. at six, and they would and they would extend yeah. And so you know what I'm talking about Neil. So they would extend it in already four hour movie. They'd extend it to five to six hours. So it's like starts at six p.m. and doesn't until eleven p.m. or midnight. And they just because they had all these damn commercial breaks in it, and it just it just dragged on those goddamn so, commercial breaks. <laughs> oh God, you know we we'd be happy to get commercial breaks in our podcast and give a shout out to uh, any sponsor who'd like to yeah. come on the show and give us money. Coca-Cola, are you listening? Yeah. How about, you know, Johnson & Johnson? Yeah. You know? Uh, I don't think this is a family company podcast. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? You shut your dirty whore mouth. Uh, uh, maybe but yeah, right. the, the Ten Commandments is a classic movie. It's kind of like um, It's a Wonderful Life. Shut up, Tom. Uh, but uh, It's a Wonderful Life for um, <laughs> Easter, I guess, uh, you know, because It's a Wonderful Life comes out, you know, around Christmas time. So I, I think that uh, it's such a powerful and profound part of uh, the culture, or, or at least uh, hitherto for now was. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I definitely, it came out in the mid-50s, you know, you still had the studio system. This was, at the time, one of the bigger budget box offices that came out and it was outside of having the two major stars yeah exactly what we were talking about earlier had a story that people were very familiar with obviously you know christianity the having, Bible. you know a basically two billion followers almost worldwide mm-hmm. around that time um yeah there's gonna be a lot of interest in it for people to check it out so um not not probably the one i would least recommend to watch on this list but that's just me uh what do we got well, for number five well, go ahead, go ahead. Real quick, so, like ahead. you said it sold 100 131 million tickets that doesn't mean 131 million people sat through the entire four hours. True. They right. could, have, they could yeah. have gotten up and left in the middle. That's that's accurate. But, uh, again, that kind of comes from more of the time when um, movies were closer to, like, the idea of a, a play, because plays take a long time to go through. Sure. Um, you know, and so you have intermissions, uh, you know, to, to break up the different acts. And, you know, if, if you've never seen The Ten Commandments, I would highly recommend watching it. Um because it, it's just, especially from like when he parts the Red Sea. Spoiler alert! Um, you know, it's it's just so interesting to see, you know, what that looks like and how they were able to accomplish that with, you know, the the drawings and the map paintings and all that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what do we got next? Uh, number five is uh, the movie um, Titanic from 1997. Overrated. Um, Titanic had 143 and a half million ticket sales, um, and with a box office of 1.29 billion dollars, um, Titanic was also one of the most Academy Award-winning films of all time. Oh God! And I think everybody uh, pretty much uh, saw it when it came out. Yeah, of course everybody saw it. Yeah. T- tied uh, tied the original Ben Hur. And uh, Lord of the Rings uh, Return of the King for most, uh, the only time actually in history currently that a movie has been nominated and won every single nom- a category it was nominated for. Uh, pretty sure they all share it with 11 Oscars apiece. For yeah. the three of them. Um, God, I mean, I remember when Titanic was the thing when it came out. I just, I've never. I mean, that was the first time that I saw that I saw a pair of a pair of breasts. Oh, apparently, yeah. I remember I was yeah. when Leonardo DiCaprio had his shirt off. Yeah, yeah, that okay. was it. Yeah, Good. those man, those man titties. Okay. Yeah, uh, my my well, Grant actually, we were twelve or something. He calls me. He's like, "Dude, you got to see this. Come over." And I was like, "Okay." So I go over. I'm like twelve or thirteen. Mm-hmm. He's like, "Check this out." And he like rewinds on the little VCR to the scene where. Leonardo's painting Kate or drawing Kate Winslet Mm -hmm. and I'm like god her breasts are super pointy is that how they're supposed to look and he's like I guess so (laughs) that's a fantastic story Johnny thank you for sharing it with all of us um (laughs) the for me I always thought it was interesting with Titanic because uh like when you got the VHS, which was like a big old timey kind of plastic thing that movies used to come on uh Uh, two VHSs yeah it was a two VHS VHS, and 
it is a very distinct difference in the movie from the first um, VHS to the second one. Because, like, I would always like popping in the second VHS because that's when it hits the iceberg and, you know, it's more actiony and kind of thrilling like that. And then the first one is more about the character development and setting up the, the, the world. So I always thought that was kind of a neat little dichotomy there. It's just, it's, it was just a larger bud, budget and an overpriced version of, like, a prince in the show real kind of thing. It was a guy who is a, with a rags to riches story. It's the guy from the slums meets the rich heiress to the throne or the of whatever. And but she was out of money. Money. It doesn't matter. Oh, okay. she, she came. It's 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 just it's a classic tale that they've been telling for years. It's not a new idea. There's there's nothing trailblazing or revolutionary about the thought process behind the actual story and the only reason that I don't know I, I mean I understand that the graphics for its time were really good I, I can't listen to that damn Celine Dion song anymore don't start singing it because I will punch you in the side of the head god damn it uh, we don't have copyright for that oh, oh, oh. <laughs> That's right. no 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 we don't want YouTube to flag us James Cameron no I, I, don't, I don't know man look I mean I get it it was Probably the first love story in a while that came with that type of budget, with those type of graphics, with the that all-star cast and all-star directing and score team behind it. Yeah, I mean, with, like, star power like Billy Zane and David Warner. How, how Bill can you Paxton. That? Yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah I'm, sure, I'm sure Kate Winslet, Leonardo DiCaprio, and Kathy Bates had nothing to do with that. Okay. Who? Who yeah. are these people you're talking about? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. There's, there's no one. They're no one at all. They're B-listers, for I, sure. I, I will say, though, that one interesting thing is if... Um, you have time to go on and YouTube it. They did film an alternate ending to Titanic. Oof, best part of the movie, uh, by the way. Which is just, like, it's crazy because uh, they're, like, struggling over the diamond before she tosses it into the uh, the ocean. Um, so I would highly recommend that you watch that because you'll be like, is this a spoof? <laughs> that, but no, that's, like, actually what happened. That was the only good, that was the only good part of the, the film that I see. And they didn't even put it in the movie. I remember when they, they showed it to James Cameron, he was like, this... This what, is the what, end? What do, you, what do you mean that was the only good part of the film? That was that, the only good part of it. That film had a lot of really good moments and Name memorable moments. one outside of that scene. Go ahead. Okay, when they're on the, the front of the boat and uh, the wind's going through. I mean, that is an iconic piece of film. It's iconic because the studio paid a lot of money to advertise that scene, which made it become iconic. It has nothing, and it's because it's during that, that, that fucking Celine Dion song. Yeah. It's not. It, there's nothing special about it. There's nothing special. Okay, I think I. I it's I, not gonna... original. It's just. It's <laughs> un- <sighs> You know my thoughts on this, man. I don't. I think Titanic's a, uh, overrated. <clears throat> it's not a piece of shit. It's not a horrible film. It's just that it's it's put in to the vault as one of the greatest films to ever be created, and it's not an original story. There's nothing new about it. It's well, been done only like four tons- stories in the whole world. I mean, you it's just that's how you retell them. No, this, this is not true. This is not true. That's the story has been told before, and it's been told better in a lot of instances. Sorry. Anyways, I'll, I'll leave it alone. I'll leave it alone. Neil, what do you think about Titanic? Are you a fan or I think not it's, a fan? I think it's the best story about a sinking boat ever. <laughs> uh, well, well, hold on here. Now we got to talk about the Poseidon adventure. We're, we're not talking about Poseidon adventures right now. All right, fine. Uh, moving What's on. Next? Let's move on. Speaking move on. of overrated <laughs> movies, number four is I'll get the uh, E.T. the here. Extraterrestrial, 1982. Again, greatest director, Steven Spielberg. Greatest director. Okay, in between 1970 and 2000. I'll give that to yeah, you. Yeah. Um, had 148 million ticket sales. Uh, with a adjusted box office of one point three three billion dollars, um, and E.T. Uh, really uh, was you know it was a great movie for Reese's Pieces. It was yeah. Reese's. Yeah, they really came into their own for that. You know, it really M and M's really made a bad M&M's choice. M and M's missed out on that <laughs> opportunity. Yeah. That's like Blockbuster not buying Netflix. Oh, someone like, I was someone got fired for that decision. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. They, they put a bullet through their brain. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> uh, I mean, I I love I loved ET as a kid. Uh, it's got a nostalgia factor for me. I've seen it as an adult. It's fine. You know, it's like for me, I, I like Close Encounters of the Third Kind better. Honestly, yeah, I would e. agree to that. Um, but that's just me. I mean, it's 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 the same thing, though. I mean, it's it's a story about you know it's like you know it's the same story. They just didn't come up with a love story new. between a kid and an alien. <laughs> right? No, yeah. you're right. I would agree with you. It is the same story, but they did use they did use different characters at least. They used an alien. 
instead of a, a dog you are or reaching a younger, so far, a younger friend. Oh no, get God. the fuck out of here. Uh, I'm not reaching far. No, that's, I don't know. I mean, you know, a lot of these, I think any movie that was sci-fi related directed that had a big budget that was directed by somebody like a Spielberg or a Cameron or a, uh, I don't know, a Hitchcock or a Robert Zemeckis or anything like that back mm. in the, the 70s, 80s kind of thing. I th- the majority of them probably just did well because sci-fi was not terribly mainstream and made by a lot of different companies. There were only a couple that came out each year. Mm-hmm. Once again, take a look at our progression of, of, of sci-fi over the history of cinema, and it'll explain that. But So I, th- I think E.T. was a product of that era. Like it, it, There weren't a ton of sci-fis coming out at that time. So when you see something like this at the time, those types of puppeteering and graphics mm-hmm. were something that we hadn't really seen before. You know, right. It wasn't terribly common, so I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a decent movie. I just... Uh, it's like when I compare it to a movie like The Goonies or something, I, I much more enjoy The Goonies than E.T. E.T. to me is, I don't know why, but it's just, it feels like a very slow moving movie. Yeah. I, I But I think I think a lot of E.T.'s success just came from the fact that it was a universal picture. They probably had the budget right. for advertising and it had Steven Spielberg and Kathleen Kennedy attached to it. So I think right. that had a lot to do with it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, like uh, the video game also was such a huge boost to it. <laughs> I mean, that's probably one of the top five games. There's a fucking games video that, game? Yeah, E.T. Yeah, is you haven't played the E.T. No, I actually game. haven't played the E.T. I, I, rarely play, uh, I rarely play any video games outside of Madden and NBA 2K. So, I mean, no, if it's you, a, you, you played uh, Total War. I do play yeah, Total, play Total War. War. I do play Company Heroes. That's true. I, I do. But, but that's just recently. The, the video game for E.T. is widely considered to be the worst video game ever made. <laughs> like, Is it worse than the Room video game? No, the room video. The room video game. If you haven't played it, you can play it online for free. Just Google Jesus. it. But that's a great <laughs> game. ET was a terrible game. All right, let's uh, take your word for it. What system was it on? I think it was the Atari, right, Neil? I do believe so. Okay. okay. All right. What, what do we got for number? Th- what top three? Top three okay. of. Top three, uh, The Sound of Music, 1965, okay. 157 million tickets oh. sold, uh, gross income of $1.41 billion when adjusted mm-hmm. for inflation. Hell yeah. Uh, one of my favorite movie musicals of all time, but you know me, I'm also just in general a big fan of big fan of musicals. Mm. Um, I mean, this was at the tail end of... The this studio was, system. Of yeah. the studio system falling. But I was saying it's also at the tail end of the golden era of cinema where um, westerns and musicals were the most prevalent uh, mm-hmm. type of money money grabber. Uh, and then you put in a star like you put in a star like Julie Andrews, you know, and for her, Julie Andrews, Mary Poppins at that time, you know, it had it came out a year earlier. So she had already started her ascension into a different stratosphere as far as A-list actors go. You know, you put her up at that time with Catherine and Audrey Hepburn and, um, you know, Elizabeth uh Uh, Not Elizabeth Hurley. um, Taylor? Taylor, thank you. Sorry. It was like the one that always smells like that vodka. Taylor, that's right. The one that always smells like vodka. Elizabeth Taylor. It's supposed to be Elizabeth Taylor. Oh, that's what what everybody said when they were on set with her. Like, they could distinctly know where she was in a room because you would smell vodka. Well, she was a terrible alcoholic, so yeah. (laughs) Let's make fun of her for that. Alcoholics are horrible people. No one likes a quitter. That's true. Uh, but yeah, the Sound of Music. Uh, you know, it's it's a great movie. It's got these just beautiful sweeping vistas. But you know, right. uh, the, of course, the most famous and iconic shot is when she's on the hill singing, spinning around. The hills are alive yeah. with the sound. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the one, Johnny. Yeah, um, you want me to sing the whole song? Yeah, no, no, let's not. No, do we that. don't have the copyright for it. We don't okay. have the copyright. Damn, Disney will sue it. us. Okay. Don't you worry. <laughs> uh, but yeah. yeah, I mean, it it, well, it was, did, Disney it was, did it was a music. great. Uh, it's a great movie. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I think for people that are our age, um, I think I, most I people know, have still have seen that. I, I don't know if like younger people have seen the sound of music. Um, I think a fair amount. I mean, maybe not. I mean, I know that back in when they had like music classes in elementary school, my first time seeing sound of music was, of course, I just happened to be very close to my grandparents growing up and they, they loved this era of, um, of musical cinema. Mm-hmm. But I remember in fourth and fifth grade, we had watched it as part of music. It was part of the music curriculum to watch that and then go over the, the different notes of do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do and all that. Right. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you guys had to go through that too. Um, but but yeah, uh, it's a powerful, uh, powerful movie about uh, the Von Trapp family escaping yeah. from uh, the Nazis. So if you haven't seen The Sound of Music, you should. All uh, right, moving on to our number two. Real, uh, quick, real quick, I want to yeah, ask you, Gary, what, is, what do you think happened in 1965 that both The Sound of Music and Dr. Zhivago came out the same year and are on this top ten list? 
Uh, you know, that's an excellent question, Neil. Um, 1965, uh, you know, I I don't know if they just uh, really had, you know, two excellent movies. Um, I haven't seen Dr. Zhivago, as I said, so I can't really comment on it. But, like, I don't know if they had two excellent movies just come out and they were, like, really popular or if they were maybe spaced apart, like one came out earlier in the year and the other one came out later. Uh, so that that's a good question. It is. Why do you think, Neil? I don't know. I was just oh. curious. Okay, well, good. You, you got me on my heels. Good job. Good job. <laughs> uh Number two is uh, a movie that came out in 1977. I don't What's think that? I've seen this one either. It's okay. called Star Wars. Star Wars? I don't yeah. Never seen it. Never heard of it. Uh, Star mm. Wars had a estimated ticket sales of $178 million with a revenue of $1.6 billion. Mm. Um, and, uh, Neil, you want to tell us uh, what's, what, what Star Wars is? Uh, I believe it's some kind of space opera that's a love story oh. that's about a sinking ship. I think that's God damn it. <laughs> it. It's basically the Titanic of the 1970s. Okay, well, there you it, go. Yeah. That's why Star Wars space is better space than fucking Titanic. Titanic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, Star Wars, uh, again, what, what I think was so popular with Star Wars is it was such a... Uh, like a simple kind of movie because it's, it's, you know... Uh, movie about uh, a hero that has to save the damsel in distress um, and you know you've got very clear cut good and evil in it um, and it's 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 a fun adventure story where you you know uh, you, you've got characters that you like and you enjoy and really kind of wraps up all in one movie which I think is something we really don't have today much anymore like very few movies are willing to say hey at the end of the first movie this is the end and you know I, I'm not really looking to make a sequel of they, course, they, they made a lot of sequels. Of course, though. they did make a lot of sequels to this. Um, <laughs> they but. did. They did. It was not an open ended right. ending. It, they it, did close it. Right. Yeah, they did close it out at the end. Very true. Yeah. Which a lot of films typically, do that. they will find a way to make a sequel if the movie makes one point six billion dollars. Sure. I think. I think they can probably do that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's interesting. I've always wondered though why we t we talk about. We talked about an early episode about 2001, A Space Odyssey, which came mm. out in 69, 68. Uh, um, yeah, 68. Yeah, so almost 10 years earlier, which you claim, which Gary claims he thinks has better graphics than Star Wars. Oh, yeah, initially. yeah. 2001 um, looks way better right. than Star Wars. Why, due to the fact that Star Wars was nowhere, was not close to coming out at all in the 60s, like they did, I mean, I don't know when Lucas came up with the original idea, but the fact that 2001, A Space Odyssey is not... It's, it's it's a first of its kind. It's mm -hmm. got better graphics than a lot of these other films that mm -hmm. some people say still hold up to today, to, to today. Why is it not on this top 10 list? Why is, you know... Yeah, two, 2001's initially. a very slow and, intros it, it, True. and introspective movie. But did people know that when they saw the previews? How come it doesn't have one of the records for, like... I'm just curious what mm -hmm. you guys think. Like, why doesn't it have a record for one of the largest box office opening weekends? You yeah, know, like well, why? I, I mean, with I, all the effects on the previews that it has. Like, yeah, I, I mean, like, I, I wasn't around when Star Wars came out, but I imagine that when it did, like, you know, everyone was like, oh, have you seen Star Wars? It's really cool. If you haven't seen it, you know, let's go this weekend and go yeah. check it out. I don't, I can't imagine that kind of uh, impetus for people talking about 2001. <laughs> yeah, 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 2001's yeah, like, hmm, yeah, so Kubrick's <laughs> news 2001 was very interesting. I loved how it delineated between the monkeys and people in space. You know, it's just, it's, it's a different <laughs> feel to it, you yeah. know? I mean, I guess at the time, too, like, yeah, there was, there. I don't recall there being any super large stars in 2001 A Space Odyssey. I mean, I guess with Star Wars, they, I, at the time, Harrison Ford and Carrie Fisher and Mark Hamill weren't big stars no. before this, but you had guys like uh, Alec Guinness, who was already a pretty well-known, established actor. You had, um, I don't know if uh, James Earl Jones was really established as well at that time. Maybe Guinness was the only one. I, I think Guinness was the only uh, big star yeah. attached to and that. And Harrison had some notability. He came off American Graffiti, and there was a couple other projects he... That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, like, American Graffiti wasn't, he like, didn't a make major... Like Star Wars did. Uh, but, a major box office But that is draw. a good point. Yeah, I, I totally forgot I was in that. Um, but yeah, Alec Guinness had already had a pretty significant career up until that point. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, and what's really interesting about Star Wars is, uh, from all the stories I've heard on it, it was really saved in the editing room, which is why post-production mm. is such an important process 
process because um, basically George Lucas uh, gave all the film to his wife, who then edited it, and like it was just a, a gigantic mess. Um, <laughs> and really tightened it up, rearranged some of the the, the scene orders, okay. and uh, you know made it a much more compelling story. I didn't know his wife was an editor. That's cool. Uh, that's the story I heard. I Ooh. haven't met her yet, though. Okay. I'm sure she's either... You probably never will, so no, no worries. Uh, um, what do we got for number one? And the, the number one highest uh, grossing movie is, uh, of course, Gone with the Wind, 1939. Um, a super major movie that came out. Uh, 200, more than 200 million tickets were sold with an adjusted gross of $1.1 billion. $1.81 uh, $1 billion, yeah. Yes, $1.81, thank you. Um, and, of course, uh, we have paraphrased the title of our podcast, I Don't Give a Flick, uh, True. based on uh, the closing line of this movie. Uh, from Rhett Butler saying, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Yes. Um, yeah, and uh, it's just uh, uh, an astounding, it's a great movie if you haven't had a chance to watch it. Um, you know, it uh, takes place uh, well, slightly before, during, and after the, the Civil, Civil War. War. Um, and just, it's, you know, a sweeping tale. Like, 1939 was a great year for movies. I mean, you had The Wizard of Oz come out. Um, Neil, have you had a chance to see Gone with the Wind? Yes. Okay. What did you think about it? I mean, I saw it when I was really young, and I don't think I could appreciate it uh, very much then, but I went back and watched it a few years ago, and it's uh, it's number one for a reason. It's a, it's a classic story. Yes, yeah. it is a classic story. It it, it came out, it, yeah, it started love stories back before they had been destroyed, like when Titanic did it. Right, yeah, because yeah. Titanic is known for destroying love stories. It is. Yeah. It's ruined love stories yes. for all of Americans. For all of Americans, ever since ruined then. by Titanic. Yeah, That's, I mean, this this mm -hmm. one also at the time, on record, had the largest marketing budget of any film in the history of cinema up until that point. Uh, now, granted, this was in 1939, so, uh, I mean, I don't even know how many houses had televisions back in 39 so Zero. I mean, it, 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 yeah, yeah well uh, it was probably mostly yeah like news article clippings billboards in certain cities um and, and stuff like that but uh yeah i don't know i mean for me to go with the wind it's i i appreciate what it was able to do it's kind of like the same thing like i appreciate citizen kane i don't like it mm -hmm. but i i appreciate what it did for cinema as a whole and the stories that have uh you know that have uh been after that and have, have come from that initial storyline so yeah i mean uh uh yeah, I, I would agree to that. Like uh, uh, Gone with the Wind, um, you know, much like Citizen Kane, um, it's like because Gone with the Wind's a long movie. I think it's like more than three hours long. Yeah, it's or not so. quite the ten. It's not quite the Ten Commandments, no, but <laughs> but like there there is an intermission in it, um, God, and yeah. uh, you know it's uh, really a, a powerful, compelling movie. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's our list of uh, our the top ten blockbusters adjusted for inflation of all time. Uh, okay, so let's let's go ahead and jump over really quick um, to the just all time highest grossing films not adjusted for inflation, both domestic and international box office. And we will tell you ahead of time that pretty much all of these movies, of course, have been within the last twenty five years. Um, actually, all all of them have been within the last twenty five years. Half of them uh, are owned by Marvel, and eight of them are owned by Disney as a whole. Um, um, so let's go ahead and start with uh, number ten here. Yeah, and you know, uh, it, it, as Johnny said, it's going to be a much different list just because uh, inflation has played such a, a key difference uh, because. More modern movies, you know, when you have a ticket price of fifteen dollars, you know, and if you have a movie like Gone with the Wind that was selling them for like twenty five cents, two bits, uh, you know, <laughs> you, there's just no way you can sell that many tickets. Absolutely. Uh, so we'll go ahead. So we'll go ahead just for for time's sake here. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and we'll we'll just give you the global box office for now. Uh, number ten on our list was Black Panther. Came out in twenty eighteen. Okay. Um. So Black, a yeah, Disney Black movie. Yeah, another Disney movie, correct, and and the first Marvel movie on this list. Uh, global box office came in at one point three billion, essentially one point three five billion, uh, and domestic box office gathered about six hundred million. Um, why this? I, I think this one's honestly pretty obvious. Why this one came in at number ten? Um, outside of being a Marvel movie, uh, if you don't count Blade, it's kind of a hero, I guess. Um, I I personally can't. You know, you don't count like. Shaft, I guess you know it's the first comic superhero movie that features the main uh, protagonist as being black. Uh, what and about Blank Man? 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what, what about Blazing Saddles? <laughs> <laughs> they weren't superheroes. They were just heroes. Did you say Blank Man? Was that the one with Damon Wayans? That was a great movie. <laughs> or Robert Townsend. Uh, I can't remember. It was like who was it was the Wayans. Yeah. It, it was Damon Wayans. Yeah. Oh, it was the... Okay, or gotcha. Meteor Man. And, and Meteor Man. That yeah. was Robert Townsend. That's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. Um, and those were those were funny movies. But this one was... This one obviously more had... More serious, yeah. Yeah, this was more serious. Had the largest budget. Um, you know, it was the first... Technically, the... If you want to, technically the first comic book movie to actually be nominated for Best Picture, uh, among among amongst many movies. Um, look, don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I appreciate that they are. You know, it's just like Wonder Woman. You know, I appreciate that they're they're trying to they're trying to spread out the diversity of the types of heroes that they have in movies, and they're trying to you know accommodate all all races and genders and stuff. And I get it, but. Black Panther, as a whole, was a fine superhero movie, but it was not good enough to be on the list for for Best Picture. I'm just I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna straight up say it. It I, why why was it why was it on the list for Best Picture? I mean it it yeah, I mean the, the graphics were there at a good it had a great soundtrack. Uh, the acting was was pretty damn good, but I don't know. I just it's kind of like having a it's kind of like having a, an animated film being nominated for. Uh, you know, or, you know, or like a, not a slapstick comedy, but I guess there have been comedies nominated for Best Picture, but I put that in the same realm as um, animated features, you know, being nominated for Best Picture. Mm -hmm. I I mean, I had seen, I mean, we probably see between all of us, what do we see? You know, 50 to 100 movies a year, if not a little more, maybe. I've I've actually not seen any movies this year in the box. Okay. All right. All right. But, but I mean, but I mean, prior to 2020, you know, um, and I mean, there were probably, there were probably uh, 10 to 15 other movies, maybe more that I had seen that I was like, oh, okay, cool. Like mm-hmm. that, that's going to get Oscar nod because you know, it, it just moved yeah. me in a well, certain, that's the great thing about nominating like 37 films for best picture, you know, like it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it, you know, everybody can get the nomination. Hey, dark, dark Knight got, got yeah, shafted that one year no. and it was definitely one of the best films of the year. It absolutely was. And that, that actually should have, that actually should have been the first, uh, the first superhero one nominated, I guess. But see, even then I didn't. <laughs> No, Super, I, Superman 1977 should have been the first superhero movie to win the Oscar. Gary, if this goes off based off your argument, you would think that Spider-Man 2 should have been the first superhero movie ever nominated for the Best Spider-Man Picture. Spider-Man 2 should have won for Best Picture. And <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No doubt about that. Uh, <laughs> okay, what's our number nine? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, but I mean, uh, and Neil, what do you think? I mean, that's kind of a, that's kind of a big topic. What do you, do you think it it was it was good enough to be? It was a good superhero movie. Don't get me wrong, but was it good enough to be nominated for Best Picture? I don't think so. Like you said, it was an entertaining film. It was a good Marvel movie. Uh, they did do well diversifying, you know, and spreading the net to a wider audience. Yeah. But as, as far as Perhaps the picture of the year. I don't think so. Yeah, and I think we can all agree that yeah, or I think we can see what they're doing. Obviously, like again, definitely appreciate that and agree that that is something that should be done more. But but for best picture of the year, I I, I don't know. It's just it superhero movies are too zany and they just are over the top at points. You know, it's not necessarily comical, but it's just too beyond belief for me. I don't know. Okay. Anyways, number nine. Um, this one I was really surprised because it was the worst Avengers movie in my opinion but number nine was Avengers Age of Ultron uh, brought in uh, internationally 1.4 billion dollars of the box office not um, a bad haul not a bad haul not a bad haul at all um, but it just plays back to the same topic we were talking about what makes a success one of the things that makes a successful blockbuster mm-hmm. is an existing like Neil, Neil you'd said like the sequels are usually the big ones like it's an existing franchise that drives the train mm-hmm. you know um, yeah and I, I think um I would agree with you that uh, Age of Ultron was the weakest of the Avengers movies, uh, but I think that people went to see it because they knew that it was part of a story. True. And they needed to have, you can't not have that little middle link right there. Right, which is the, really the brilliance and the genius behind what the MCU has been able to do over the last 12 years yeah. is they you start with Iron Man and then you build a story in every single movie mm-hmm. that comes in, no matter how small it may be, if it's if it's Ant-Man or, you know, if it's as big as, you know... Is that a joke? Iron... Shut up. Ant-Man it, it, it was not a pun, okay. if I, I guess, you know, <laughs> unintentionally. Um, or it was something as big as, you know, the first Iron Man or you know Captain America Civil War or mm-hmm. something like that um, or just any, any of them you know 
every single piece that you put into is a piece of the puzzle to the final lead up, mm -hmm. um, which obviously makes sense for our, our number one grossing movie. Hint, hint. Um, so I don't know. Neil, what did you think? I mean, you, you've, you've seen all the Avenger movies and stuff, and I know you're I don't know how big of a fan of them you are. But what did you think of Age Ultron? Uh, I agree. I think it was one of the weakest ones. I'm personally a huge Joss Whedon fan. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was really excited, you know, when he did the first Avengers. Uh, I've been a fan of all of his other work. But as, as far as an Avengers movie go, it just was was lacking for me. Yeah. So if you're uh, a Joss Whedon fan, are you, do you like that everything he does pretty much gets canceled before you can really uh, uh, get <laughs> oh, it off the ground? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so great to, to watch one season of a really great show and then it get canceled. Yeah. Even half a season, really. <laughs> It's fine. Uh, <laughs> number eight on the list uh, is a film from 2015, Furious 7, which brought in $1.5 billion from the international box office. Mind-blowing um, that this mind is still... <laughs> well, that, that, that's the reason that uh, The Rock was the highest paid actor in Hollywood. And for, Vin Diesel. And Vin was Diesel. also up there with him. Yeah, for, for a number of years. For, I mean, For some reason, people love... And I've seen a couple of the Fast and Furious movies. Um, I mean, they're not bad action movies. No, I, I think that but, they do a great job of just being action movies. Like, mm -hmm. they're, they're, you know, popcorn movies that you just sit down and you, you watch a movie and you have a good time. It's a good way to put it. Yeah. Popcorn movies, yeah. yeah. You just and sit down on your couch. I, I don't think there's anything in. wrong with that. I mean... There's uh, nothing wrong with Because, I mean, that. nobody's nominating this for Best Picture. But, like, you know, it's just a, a fun little action uh, movie that you can go and watch and be like, hey, you like cars drifting around Tokyo or whatever? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's... And, and as Neil put earlier, a lot of these are just going to be products of an, exi an already existing franchise um, that had become popular. And I, what's funny is, you know, we, we see Vin Diesel uh, as over the last five years is one of the top five highest paid actors in Hollywood on average since 2015. And it's primarily it's either from a Fast and the Furious movie or for some reason saying the same word over and over again for Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh, that's, a Disney, that's a Disney show, so yeah. That is a Disney show, but, I mean, he's he's making all this money off two series and not doing any other films for the most part. Well, how I great just find would that, that be? Like, his script is like one sentence. I am Groot. That's it. I'm Groot. It just says it in 50 <laughs> different ways, and they just decide what yeah. they want to use at this, because it's not him yeah. doing it. It's one day in the recording studio. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I in the world. I mean, I, 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 I love know that. that. I know that there is a video out there somewhere on one of these uh, Marvel sets of Vin Diesel, and he's like, "What's my line?" And I, I would love to see that because he's got one line. Yeah, over and over. Uh, yeah. Number seven was the original Marvel's The Avengers, global box office of one point five. Uh, one eight billion, and I, I mean this. They, they had actually been leading up to this, like we had said, since uh, Iron Man came out in two thousand and eight. They mm -hmm. had it was a four year build up of that. The first, the initial four, um, the horrible. Uh, technically, the best Hulk movie we have had to this date with Edward Norton, but it was still pretty bad. Probably the my worst, my least favorite Marvel. Is movie. Is that the one with uh, Tim Roth? Yes. Yeah. yeah, where he pay, he plays, yeah, it's yeah. And Liv Tyler and William Hurt. That was way um, better than the Ang Lee one, though. Oh, God, with Eric Banya? Yes. <laughs> where they actually, I, I like the idea behind the original Ang Lee one, though, where they actually tried to make it look like a comic strip with the different yeah, uh, cinematography that, that shots, was cool. the different frames. Um, that was that was nice. But uh, the story was so terrible. Yeah, it, it was. But yeah, so the Avengers is a culmination of sort of uh, the the first. I think that was Phase One. That was Marvel. tier. Yeah, Phase yeah. One. Correct. That is yeah. So phase, phase One. For all you that know, there were th three phases that built up over the last twelve years, essentially every four years, um, for the Marvel universe. Uh, and yeah, Phase One was the first set of movies for Iron Man, Captain America, Thor, and the Incredible Hulk. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess Iron Man Two as well. Yeah. Um, and they they did a really good job of. Because they had to weave so many storylines in to just get to Avengers, the original. And then all of those storylines built. It was like a trilogy that was built on a trilogy. So, <laughs> like, it was just a, a very complicated and uh, uh, ginormous movie because right. all, all 23 films or so are, you yeah. know, basically just one one storyline. It's cool to yeah. watch. It's, it's one space opera. It's... One space opera. It's not. One space it's love it's story it's with a sinking. <laughs> oh God! With a sinking ship. The sinking ship is the studio. And speaking of the next movie, movie, what's our next uh, movie? Well, it's not. That's not our next movie. Jurassic World is actually our next movie. No, but, but it sure sinks. <laughs> <laughs> Number six was Jurassic World from 2015. Uh, international box office 1.671 billion. Um, so with this one, I mean, 
Gary, I, Gary is Gary is a purist for pretty much any film prior to 2000, like the original. This doesn't go with just well, Star no, Trek. I, I just like good movies, and you I know, know I, th I think I think you're you're you. I know you like good movies, and I would have to say, obviously, the first Jurassic Park was much better than Jurassic oh, World. Yeah, of course. Uh, I can't remember who directed the first Jurassic Park. Oh yeah, that was the best. I director agree. He was the Spielberg. best director of all time from 1970 <laughs> to 2000, but he has not been the same in the last two decades. And I I, I agree to that. Um, but yeah, uh, Jurassic World. Uh, uh, Neil, you're you're a big fan of Jurassic Park as well. Um, like, what did you think of Jurassic World? Uh, I mean, it was good. It was a good action film. Uh, and but I feel like they just spent too much money making it a Jurassic Park movie, and not just a different action movie. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. I like Chris Pratt. Um, I like Vincent D'Onofrio. But as far as the rest of the cast, I could have taken and leaving them. Yeah. And like, I, I would agree that they didn't, they had all of the, the fireworks and the, the glitz, but they didn't have any of the, the heart, you know, that the original Jurassic Park had. Cause I mean, I can name off every character in the original Jurassic Park movie. Um, oh, for sure. But sure. I, I can't name a single person, a single character in Jurassic World. I, I, yeah. Look, I, I think, I mean, it, it took a different, it took a different route. It, it honestly, it, it, it placated to the fans of, of people who really loved Chris Pratt from Guardians of the Galaxy. Which he the is time. great in. And he, he is great. And people loved him in house. You know, a lot of the movie was based around him inside of the Jurassic Park world. I personally thought it was, I mean, I thought it was, it was pretty savvy with, with the wit that it had, you know, I mean, they didn't really have that in the first Jurassic Park very often. Is it as good as the first one? Absolutely not. I mean, you can't compare the two, mm. honestly, but do I think it's a piece of shit? No, I don't. I think it, it did well at the box office for a reason. The second one that was not Jurassic World 2, but, um, Fallen Kingdom, Fallen, Fallen Kingdom, Kingdom. Yeah. That one, I ended up, I did end up seeing that and that one made no goddamn sense at all. And I'll, I'm going to have a podcast just about that because it's ridiculous. Um, but I think this one it it was a good as you put it a popcorn thriller mm -hmm. i thought it was savvy and witty due to its lead stars mm -hmm. and the you know the comedians they carefully placed inside supporting roles here and there um and i thought it was entertaining i thought it's like like furious seven it mm -hmm. did what it needed to do it would be a movie that i'd pay some money to go see i wouldn't regret seeing it but i probably wouldn't go back five six seven times to right. watch it over the I course of my life i think jurassic world came out at a good time for a Jurassic Park movie. It sure. had been enough time that the people who had saw Jurassic Park when they were younger now had kids. They wanted to share that experience with their kids. And I think that's what aided to a lot of the success of it. Yeah, because they're, um, I don't, I, th I can't remember if Hasbro was the one that had the um, licensing rights for the toys, but I remember the toys when Jurassic World came out, they like tripled in profits for that like three month span mm -hmm. during the summer after the film came out just because kids were buying it up you know mcdonald's had a licensing agreement with them to like add those to you remember when they did when we were kids like yeah. power rangers came out or jurassic <laughs> park or or whatever yeah uh, I, I, I will say that uh, uh jurassic park the original game or the original movie had a pretty good game on the sega genesis too <laughs> so sure did. good good job for you jurassic park <laughs> uh but yeah um uh, definitely neil uh, playing on the nostalgia factor there you know I, I just I, I regret to think about like some poor guy who's who's young, you know, son or daughter looks up to him and says, Papa, why did you like this kind of movie when you were my age? And like, how do you how do you respond to your kid? Why is the child sound like Oliver Twist? Please that, that, that's household. what all children sound like. Yes. What else is he going to sound like? Not British? That, yeah, that's <laughs> not, a, not a young British 12 year old. <laughs> Uh, let's <laughs> let, let's move let's move on. Um, I, I, I agree. Uh, <laughs> this is a silly topic. This is uh, number five, which I Avengers: Infinity War, 2018, uh, the part one of the Infinity War saga, the end, the conclusion of possibly easily one of the greatest mm. series of of films, easily the greatest, the longest running story uh, in the history of 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 hollywood uh 2.048 billion internationally uh the first one on our list to cross the two billion dollar threshold uh personally uh, uh, by far my favorite of out of all the marvel films i mean it finally i think it was actually leaps and bounds ahead of endgame honestly i really loved how i'll let you talk about that uh I, I really enjoyed how they finally brought all the stories together and uh they just do such a good job in the marvel universe of giving ample 
equal time to all of the main heroes, you know, whether it's Captain America or Black Panther or Thor or Iron Man or Spider-Man or Doctor Strange or Black Widow, it doesn't matter. Like, they, they spread it around real mm. nicely. Um, and th that's a juggling act that is hard to hard to follow. Like, I mean, it had easily... Both both uh, Infinity War and Endgame had the two largest payrolls for actors in the history of cinema. I by don't doubt that. I was like over a yeah. hundred million dollars. I mean, the craft was services insane. budget was probably bigger than Gone with the Wind. <laughs> probably. Uh, what did you, What did you guys think of it? I mean, that's my take. I well, mean, uh, part, go ahead. Go ahead, Gary. Go ahead. Uh, I, I think that by far uh, Infinity War was the, the best of the Marvel movies because uh, they spent probably 40 to 50 percent of the time just with Thanos, who was the bad guy that we didn't really have much information on before. And we got to make him a character and understand him at a different level and why he was doing the things he was doing, which right. is really Unique for a lot of uh, superhero movies. You I, don't see that with the villains. You don't see. Yeah. I mean, in Spider-Man Two, like you spend a lot of time oh, with Doc Ock. Yeah, but like, scary. But, Spider-Man Two is a great superhero yeah. movie. Okay, we know. know, but yeah, but like <laughs> you, you really got to understand, you know, what Thanos was doing and his 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 points of view. And I, I think they just paced it really well. Like it was. It was kind of a slow movie. I mean, you have these enormous action scenes, yes, but like there were a lot of parts of it that moved very deliberately. Right. And Neil, what do you think? What I what I love about Infinity War, uh, personally, the same thing I love about Empire Strikes Back is that at the end of the film, the heroes are at such a low point because they've essentially been defeated, and it's a nice setup for the next movie where it turns around. Yeah, that's a really good point. I never even thought about that. Uh, I mean, it, I, I, I just love it when they give glimpses into the past of the, it, whether it's the protagonist or the antagonist, and it allows you to, it allows them to make the characters more relatable to the audience, and it you're, you have something invested mm -hmm. in the film. You have something to root for, and even though you're rooting for the Avengers, because we've been, we've been built to love them for 10 years, and we have glimpses of Thanos as this monstrous, tyrannical monster essentially um you know and 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 alien leader um but then in this movie all of a sudden they they talk about you know why he's doing it and his love for gamora and they try to humanize him and so it made it i was conflicted at the end i was like god i i don't want him to win but at the same time like yeah. oh they like you know he actually he has a heart there's something earnest about him that in a very small microscopic level um but it's still there yeah so. and they, they did a good job of um, meeting a lot of expectations of people that were familiar with the comics, uh, right. like the snap. Um, mm. it, it was done a little bit, you know, it, it was done to kind of, you know, really build up and that, that felt very, um, momentous, you know, like that's what 12 years of movie movies had built up to. Yeah. Uh, number four coming in, we had uh, Star Wars: The Force Awakens, the 2015, uh, uh, the initial, I guess, of Star Wars, if you want to call it a third phase, I don't know if they have it like Marvel where they have different phases. But I don't think they have any I, plans. Okay. Like it's just kind of just a money we're, we're gonna throw whatever the hell we can <laughs> yeah. out there. And let's just fire let's people. just take New Hope and emulate the really not emulate, just copy the entire yep. script and and add new characters, um, but make it worse. <laughs> <laughs> I saw I saw it twice in theaters. I but it's it's one of those things. It's it's of course not going to be as good as the original, but it's as you eloquently put it. It's like it's a it's a popcorn film like it's well, I mean, like it's, they didn't even like they didn't even try to make uh protagonists or antagonists that you care about like you know uh, i mean like the, the the bad guys in it are just like you know you got uh what's his name jackie gleason uh the jackie guy that, gleason no jackie gleason from the honeymooners no no <laughs> the the guy that was the the military commander oh uh yeah uh do, don not donald gleason uh D Donham, Donna Gleason. He's Brendan Gleason's son. I know who you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, okay. Um, um, anyways. And like, he's just like this raving lunatic. I mean, and if you look at like the 1977 Star Wars, um, you know, Governor Tarkin is a much more controlled, methodical kind of person. Right. Like, Dom it, Hall Gleason. Sorry. Yeah. I said it. <laughs> and like, you know, it's just, they had more character to them. Like, I don't know. It, it's very, very shallow movies that are popcorn hey. movies. I agree. I mean, they took the best parts of the original Star Wars, which was the characters, and they pushed them aside to bring these new characters that had no depth or backstory that anybody mm -hmm. put up. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it, you know, it's 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 just one of those things where it's obviously a cash grab when because uh, what Disney bought the rights for was it six billion dollars for the full franchise? Four point two billion dollars. Four point two. Okay, from from George Lucas, who is um, laughing all the way to, to the, the fucking, fucking bank. bank. <laughs> 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 out of any, I just have to ask really quick, but I know we're running out of time, but just really fast, out of those three films, out of Force Awakens, uh, Last Jedi. And um, what was the third one? Sorry, the most Rise recent. of Skywalker. Rise of Skywalker. Did you guys enjoy any of those at all? Did you enjoy any of those three? Or wait, at least which, even if you hated them, which did you think was the best one? Just real quick. I personally think the Rise of or, uh Don't say that, Neil. Don't you say Neil, it. say what you want. No, 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 no. <laughs> Get, you don't control your opinion. was the best of these three train wrecks. Fuck you. <laughs> which, which one? You said Rise of Skywalker? Yeah. Okay. All right, interesting. Gary, how about you? Oh, well, I think Last Jedi was definitely the strongest of the movies. No, absolutely what? not. What? No um, bullshit. By far the worst <laughs> one. <laughs> All three of them. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, Rise of Skywalker, I think, was the strongest of the movies. Uh, it had a lot of issues to it, but at least, you know, they were, I don't want to say they were trying something new because they just brought the Emperor back, but, right. you know, they uh, at least concluded the story, which was nice to see them try and wrap that up after the train wreck that was The Last Jedi. <laughs> Jedi was horrible. Perfect. Uh, okay, so let's let's move on. Number three is uh, is Titanic, nineteen ninety seven, uh, for a total box office of two point one eight seven billion. Uh, we don't need to go into this again. Yeah. We already talked about it in the last don't, list. Don't give them um, different numbers than I gave them. <laughs> that's what it says. Okay. <laughs> you also have to remember, people, that there are a lot of different lists out here. Um, these are just the most popular ones that were we on went through cool. and counted every ticket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's estimated. Um, so we're just going to go ahead and skip that and move on to number two, which is Avatar. Another James Cameron movie. Another James Cameron film uh, with a global box office of close to $3 billion, almost $2.789 billion. Um, so, I mean, this is basically just... I mean, it's basically just a, a retelling of Pocahontas, if you really think about it, you know, in the end. I mean, there's a space opera no, love story with a sinking ship. <laughs> God, let's just combine all of them. <laughs> Starring John Smith. Uh, um, <laughs> it was John Rolfe. That's, okay. Uh, but yeah. Uh, the, the Visually, just like 2001 A Space Odyssey, just, you know, just like, I don't know what it was, another uh, Clockwork Orange, you know, think of other just visually stimulating movies. This definitely took the cake i mean it this was around when 3d imax really started to take off at the mm -hmm. end of the 2000s and avatar kind of led the way mm -hmm. um i i i know that god i you know what i always hear that it's an overrated film i actually did enjoy it to be quite honest with you i thought it was entertaining yeah it's not a movie that i'd watch a dozen times in a row and, and i'd be like oh it's Something I could constantly watch mm -hmm. over and over again. If I We've got to go get the unobtainium. Let's <laughs> go. Let's go to the planet and get the unobtainium. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, G who played the bad guy? Uh, Giovanni Ribisi. Yeah. Played the. He was the, the bad, bad guy in uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, right? No, no. That was Jeffrey Rush. No. The. Which like, one? The Wait. British guy that they sent in the second and the third ones. That's the head of the East India Trading Company? That's a different actor. Okay. I know they do look similar, but but they, it is two different people. Okay. Um, I don't know his name, but I mean I, I don't know. It was like I said. I mean it it was James Cameron. Okay, I'll, I'll give it to him. I think James Cameron's best films were you know in the early '90s and '80s, and I, I don't really think he's had anything super great since then. That's just me. Okay. Um, he's got three more Avatar movies on the schedule. He uh, does. Uh, they're probably like thirty six more on it's the schedule. 11, it's eleven years. What are they waiting so long for? Why are they taking this long to, to, to get that Honestly, out? Honestly, I can't tell so, you that. <laughs> uh, the sequels, Avatar 2 and Avatar 3, have completed principal filming and are scheduled for release December 17, 2021 and December 2023. I think that, that's ridiculous. I, I think the thing that honestly carried carry this film outside of the visual effects uh, and the acting was just mediocre. Anytime you have Sam Worthington as your lead actor, I mean, you know, you, you look at Terminator Salvation, it was fine. It was okay, I guess. Um, anytime he's... He could, huh? Saying, was it okay? Was Terminator... Oh, Terminator Salvation? Okay. It was fine. I mean, seeing a young Arnold Schwarzenegger was funny, I guess. Okay. I don't know. It, it was it was all right. I just remember seeing it in theaters. <laughs> oh, a like, young Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> 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 Hello. 
<laughs> okay, what uh, is our number one movie, Johnny B, after uh, that, well, Avatar? Well, as I already hinted to, uh, number one is Avengers Endgame from 2019, which cleared the box office chart with $2.790 billion. That's a lot of simoleons. That is. $2,790,000,000. Some old thousand... Dollars. Yes, and yes. some change. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I'm just and, tired of talking about Avengers. Yeah. <laughs> tired mean, it, of the Marvel it, movies. It was, it was the culmination of 12 years, and like everybody had to go see it. Yeah, um, even and, though, and it, it was just honestly, I wouldn't put it in my top three favorite Marvel movies of all time. Um, you could maybe make a, a argument for top ten, I guess. Um, it rounded out the entire series. Yada yada. You had to see it if you had seen all the other ones. Otherwise, you just wasted yeah. your time over it, the last 12 years. It was, I will say, extremely satisfying at the end when Captain America's there and his arm's broken and, like, he just, like, tightens the, sh- the shield up. Yep. And, like, uh, all the Avengers come out around him and he's like, Avengers, assemble! Like, that, yeah. that was that was, a, that was what movies are supposed to do to you. I thought it would have been cool if he had said Avengers, avenge. Well, that's not really Captain America. Yeah, but that would have been awesome. What Let's, sounds better than Avengers Assemble? That's what he says. I know. Okay. Uh, okay. Would have sounded better. It would have been cooler if he just took out a sniper rifle and shot <laughs> just him or shot something. Shot Thanos in the head. Oh man, that'd be great. <laughs> uh, kill me now, Lord. Oh. <laughs> He's close to. Okay. Uh, no. <laughs> well, I think that's our list for uh, both adjusted and unadjusted blockbusters. Top what, 10. What makes a blockbuster great? Uh, thanks so much for tuning in this week, guys. And we will be back next week with another episode uh, from all of us here at I Don't Give a Flick. I'm Johnny Blackburn. I'm Gary Elmore. And I'm Neil Riley. Stay classy. <laughs> <laughs>